And yeah, we're alive. We're good. All right. Um, thank you for the invitation to, to talk to uh, everyone here. My name is Professor Frank Lee, and I am a professor of digital media at Drexel University. I am the director of the Entrepreneurial Game Studio, which is one of the um, most award-winning uh, student-based game studio, uh, student found, supporting student-found companies at Drexel University that I founded uh, in 2013. And I'm also the founding director of the, uh, oh, sorry, the founder of the the game design program at Drexel, which is one of the top game design programs um, in the nation uh, for the, consistently for the past, uh, I would say, so 10, 11 years or so. So one thing that I wanted to talk about is my work. Um, I think I've talked a little bit about my background before, so let me just do a, uh, just a small slice of some of what I do as a professor in game design. Um, whereas my students make games that are um, are the traditional entertainment games that you might see uh, on Xbox and iOS, uh, my work tends to be more on the creative arts side, where I would take digital technology and merge it with the real world, uh, with outside world, to create interesting interaction, interesting. Um, experience. Um, and these are a trilogy, a sky, what I call Skyscraper Games Trilogy, uh, citywide mixed reality games. Um, and they relate to a series, uh, three projects that I did dating back all the way to 2013 on um, using the skyscraper to create an interactive video games um, and so on. So let me talk about that. But briefly to kind of talk about my background, uh, I have uh, a bachelor's degree in cognitive science from UC Berkeley um, uh, from 1994. Um, and then I went on to a PhD in cognitive psychology uh, in uh, Carnegie Mellon University um, in, uh, from 2000, 1994 to 2000, uh, where I, when I received my PhD. Then I went on to um, Princeton Lawyer Polytechnic Institute as a professor of cognitive science for two years. Um, then I switched over and moved to Drexel University, where I am currently, as a initially as a professor of computer science, but then decided um, after 10 years in the Department of Computer Science that my work was more related uh, to digital media than computer science, so moved over as a professor of digital media at Drexel University, and I'm currently a full professor of, uh, at, at, in digital media at Drexel University, teaching game design. So um, the idea of Skyscraper Games Project for me sort of goes all the way back to kind of looking at I, I, when I was at Berkeley as an undergraduate um, around, I would say, 1990s. Um, so 1990, uh, when I, after a marathon session of Tetris, uh, about 20 hours, um, basically overnight just playing um, in the zone, playing Tetris, I had to meet a friend of mine um, in San Francisco. And if you're familiar with the geography of the Bay Area between Berkeley and San Francisco, um, I you would take the Bay Bridge is one way. You would take the Bay Bridge over from Berkeley to San Francisco. And as I was doing that in my car, the sun was setting. And as the sunlights were bouncing off of the the glass buildings in San Francisco, um, in my mind's eye, I saw little Tetris shapes rotating and falling. Um, and certainly uh, there is a, this is a very common phenomenon called Tetris effect. You could look up, you could Google it, uh, or you could find it in Wiki, where if you play too much Tetris, basically um, everything you see around the world, uh, around you, sort of becomes Tetris sized, basically. Um, so in my mind's eye, I saw little Tetris shapes in the windows of the, the skyscrapers as I was driving across the Bay Bridge. Um, and at that time, I decided to sort of put it out of my mind because I figured it was from lack of sleep um, and playing too much Tetris. So that was 1990. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2008, when I was driving in I-76, which is a freeway, freeway right next to Philadelphia. Um, and sun was said it was dark, sun was setting, it was getting dark. And there's a, there's a new building called Sierra Center that you will see on your right um, with a sort of the T 
uh, that's the Temple University logo there. Um, and that building has a unique feature in that it has LED lights that are embedded um, between every floors and about maybe like 10 feet, 11, uh, 13 feet apart horizontally between every floors. Um, so what you're seeing are those LED lights um, you know, throughout the, the facade of the building. Um, and it's 29 stories tall skyscraper that's right next to um, the 30th station, which is one of the main uh, uh, railroad stations um, in the Northeast corridor. So I saw those lights blinking. Uh, it didn't have the, the Temple University logo at the time, but usually they will have simple light shows, right? The lights would sort of change colors and sort of go in waves in colors and so on. Um, but in my mind's eye, again, I saw little tetra shapes with those lights rotating and falling. Um, and in 2008, as a professor, um, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to actually try to make a game out of that building? So that began uh, my, I guess, journey uh, to what I call the Skyscraper Games Trilogy. So I had the initial idea of making a game, some game, um, a prop, I mean, Tetris um, at the time, with that building uh, in 2008. Um, and it took me basically uh, five years in 2013 to actually showcase a game on the Sears Center. Um, so uh, people might ask, you know, did it take all five years to try in order to, uh, to complete, execute a game on that skyscraper? And what I tell them is it actually only took three months because I started, uh, maybe, yeah, I started the, near the end of January in 2013 and we showcased it in uh, the first week or the second week of April. So it took about three months but it actually took four years and five months, uh, four years and nine, nine months in order to convince a major corporation that owns that building, along with like, hundreds of other buildings across the country to let me in in their private network in order to control those uh, LED lights, which are essentially uh, smart devices on the network, uh, addressable uh, through TCP IP commands and so on. So um, I showcased Pong on the Sears Center, and I wanted to show a video of it, but I need to switch out because the sound doesn't seem to not sort of go through uh, the PowerPoint. So let me share screen um, and go to Chrome tab, and I believe uh, this is the one that I want. Yeah, let's see. Well, oh, let me, uh, because I think I need to. Let me, because I'm only sure that I need to, yeah, share audio. There you go. Share audio. Um, click this. Let's try this, and hopefully this works. to watch or participate in the world's largest video game. That is awesome, please. Yeah! The grandest game of Pong from Dr. Frank Lee of Drexel University. Yes. This has been a dream of mine for five years. But dreams don't come true without a lot of passion, dedication, determination. So actually having a game on the facade tonight is like a dream come full circle. This is how we inspire a region, uh, and this is how we show that Philadelphia has amazing minds and amazing work happening here. So did that go through with sound okay? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell from, from my side. I need to look at comments. Uh, hopefully it did. Um, and we'll continue. Let's see, share screen, go back to the PowerPoint. Actually, uh, all right, there we go. Um, so that was the Pong on the Sears Center. Um, 
Again, this is just to kind of give you a sense. This is the the 29 story tall skyscraper that, that we played Pong. Um, it is uh, uh, right next, as I mentioned, the 30th station. Um, and oh, need to so skip that. What I want to show uh, in the next video. Uh, let me just switch over. Chrome tab. So I want to show you the video from the Pong event um, uh, from essentially it's a raw footage of the video that, that I took. Um, and I want you to, I mean, you'll see the Pong game itself, but kind of listen to the audience. Let me just make sure I share audio. And... Go back to sharing back to the PowerPoint file um, application window chair. Um, so if you listen to the audio uh, of the of the Pong, um, you could basically hear as the two people were playing the game, the basically a couple hundred people that were watching the players play, they were joined in sort of the shared experience, right? Um, one thing that is a thread through all the work, all of my work and the work that I do is the desire to bring physical sharing, right? Essentially sharing physically together, uh, meaning not just sort of virtually, right? Um, having a shared experience physically um, where you have all your senses are involved, uh, your auditory senses, your visual um, smell and everything sort of is involved right? because I feel like human beings are fundamentally sort of physical animals and we're sort of designed to share in the experience together uh, in sort of closeness, not just in, uh, not just virtually. So one thing that I feel like that was missing just from pure video games, even multiplayer video games, is that all the social interaction happens online. Um, and I believe and I felt that there's something fundamentally missing, especially people who have uh, who sort of, especially parents, uh, my parents certainly as well, I'm sure your parents, um, there is this view of video games as very solitary, right? The the typical um, stereotype is, you know, this, you know, young men, like, you know, 15, 16 year old, uh, essentially uh, youth in in his room or um, in, the, in the basement just playing by themselves, you know, uh, by him or herself. Um, but I feel like if I look at my experience with video games going all the way to the golden age of the arcade games in the 80s, where when I grew up, um, playing video game was a very social experience, right? As you're playing uh, Pac-Man or Asteroids, there was a you know, essentially a, you know, a depth of five, six people deep watching you play and commenting as you saw on that um, uh, on, on the Pong, on the Sear Center. Right? So there's, there's a shared experience that I think um, is sort of unique when you're sort of together physically. Certainly we, with COVID, that can't be possible, but that has been sort of uh, a theme in my work of trying to bring uh, sensorial closeness um, beyond simple virtual um, sharing. And that that's what I've been sort of calling the aesthetics of shared experience that I think is sort of missing in the traditional games that I try to bring into my work as well. So within Pong, uh, we had 100 people play Pong, about 300 people watched the players play. Um, 
there were thousands of people across the city um, that were uh, watching from far away, watching the uh, the people play. Um, and we could sort of tell because during the two hours we had the event, um, there were people taking YouTube videos from all different parts of the city and then posting it up. Um, and certainly those videos, along with the official videos uh, that was released from the project, uh, we had you know, hundreds of thousands of people watch the video game. So it's not just a sharing of experience uh, of the you know, several hundred people that were at the event, but there was a larger sharing of the experience citywide, um, you know, worldwide, which was sort of intriguing to me. So uh, that was 2013. Um, I wanted to sort of essentially try to figure out what I wanted to do next year. And I happened upon this idea of sort of multiplayer game using two sides of the building, the north side, which you, we use for the pong, and the south side uh, of the building. So in essence, you have two players. They're basically a mile away or half mile away you know, from the building playing um, uh, against each other, so multiplayer game. Um, so that idea became uh, multiplayer, or essentially skyscraper Tetris, uh, where we have two people playing on uh, north and south face, using the north and south face display um, to play Battle Tetris. Um, the idea of Battle Tetris, if you're not familiar, is as you um, basically, uh, uh, as you're able to essentially reduce rows, class rows on your side, more rows get added to the other person's side and so on. So that's in this last person standing. So that was a project that, um, that I pursued in 2014. And I want to show you a New York Times video uh, from that event. Let me see. And switch over, share screen. Should be a master at this at this point. Chrome tab, share audio, and yes. People think of this as a game event. I think of this as a public art event. <laughs> Technology has sort of made us isolated from each other. I want us to be with each other and play with each other. It is the biggest Tetris in the world, but beyond that, it will be the biggest video game in the world. This is the Sierra Center. It's a beautiful asymmetric glass skyscraper in the city of Philadelphia. It has LED lights, uh, about 1,400 or so. If you can tell, there's a light, LED light fixture right there. And we're basically hacking into those lights to create an amazing art slash game of Tetris for uh, this week's Philly Tech Week. We've got two modes. One is we're going to play on the north side and also be reflected on the south side. But we also want to do two people playing north against south. When the blocks fall, you can fill up a row. Normally, that just disappears. But in a two-person Tetris, that row is going to show up on your opponent's side. Whoa! Part of the thing is a restriction because the, even though it's a giant building, the resolution on the building, the number of pixels that we actually get to turn on and off, is really very, very small. Most people's phones have a higher resolution than the building that we're working with. Last year, for the first time ever, we put on the interactive game of Pong for Philly Tech Week 2013. That was officially recognized by Guinness Book of World Records as the largest architectural video game display. Um, I just simply think of it as the largest display in the world. The Tetris game this year will be twice as big, so on paper, it is going to be the next world record. We just have to go through the formal process uh, of recognition. Tetris is a cultural icon. A nine-year-old child with no Tetris. A 90-year-old grandmother with no Tetris. It is worthwhile celebrating the fact that it's been with us for 30 years and Tetris still being made. Yeah, yeah I got it. Don't scare me like that. <laughs> I won! <laughs> I won! I won! <laughs> uh, let me go back to the PowerPoint file. Uh, 
Um, so with Skyscraper Tetris, uh, we had 80 people play. We were playing for about two hours, I believe probably 8.30 to 10.30 or so. Uh, it could be an hour and a half. Um, it was a one-day event, and uh, we had over 2,500 people that came to the event. Uh, we had, I think, eight food trucks. There was a live uh, retro uh, arcade bit music band. Um, that sort of played you know, classic, you know, retro uh, arcade game music. Um, and because this was in partnership with the Tetris company, um, we and it was the reason was because it was the 30th year anniversary of Tetris, we had kind of very extensive media coverage. Uh, we had about 1,500 uh, write-ups of our um, of our of the the skyscraper Tetris projects. Um, we were on the broadcast news. Uh, all the broadcast news, uh, the major news in the U.S., as well as the major national broadcast news of like 23 countries, um, including England, um, um, uh, Japan, China, and other places as well. So there was an estimate by a, a third-party uh, media analytics firm that basically said that uh, the project, based on the media coverage, had about 2 billion views uh, worldwide, uh, resulting in about $22 million in ad equivalent um, and so on. And that's only important um, for uh, uh, for drugs administration, uh, where I'm trying to show that, yes, uh, I was able to provide uh, $22 million worth of advertisement through this project uh, for Dressel. Um, anyway, the you know, for me, the project especially it was important that it be, it was pong um, because pong itself was probably the first game that i played on atari 2600 um so it was and pong is also important within the history of uh, of video games because it, is, it was the first commercial video game and tetris certainly is important to me because that's a game that i consider one of the most perfect games ever created that's an absolutely beautiful game design you know given sort of few tetronomic shapes you're able to create infinite variety of experience engagement um and so on so i mean i i just love tetris you know to to death um but the important part for this project because what i wanted to create was a a shared experience throughout the entire city right so the reason why it was on a skyscraper in that particular building was because because it was next to the uh, to the the train station. There were no other high buildings around it. The, all the other high buildings were on separate part of the city, called Center City, and we were in University City. Um, so it was visible. That building was visible all throughout uh, the city. If I had created my own essentially uh, original game and put put it up there, people probably wouldn't know what it is, mainly because you know they'll see lights turning on and off and maybe shapes moving in weird fashion, but they wouldn't recognize it. They'll look up and look down. That's probably what I would do. But the fact that I put Pong and Tetris there in 2013 and Tetris in 2014 is because both of those games have, I feel like, reached uh, their cultural icons. What I mean by that is people who never played Pong and never played Tetris would recognize what that it is a pong that it is tetris right um so just that sheer recognition allowed people from wide across the city even people who never played tetris to look up and recognize what it is and for those couple of hours that we were actually playing pong and, and tetris on the building um the entire city i would like were sort of tied together in this larger shared experience um very physical close social experience um at location but more diffused, but still a shared experience um, citywide and so on. If you actually count the, the media output, possibly billions of people around the world uh, were sharing in the, the Tetris experience, certainly. Um, so in 2013, I did Tetris, I'm uh, sorry, in Pong. In 2014, I did uh, Tetris on both sides. And Tetris is the world record, Guinness World Record for the largest architectural video game. Uh, and you could look that up. So I felt like I did what I wanted to do with the skyscraper, with uh, the Sears Center. Um, so this is a little sort of side trip um, to um, 
to my collaboration with Tech Girls. Tech Girls is a, a nonprofit that was founded in Philadelphia, but that is nationwide. And their focus is to try to encourage uh, young girls, middle school girls, to get interested in programming or get interested in STEM education by offering weekend workshops. So I work with Tech Girls to develop a game-based sort of workshop, a weekend workshop, um, where we had essentially these middle school girls. And I also work with Girl Scouts as well. So they came and they tested out our curriculum uh, for game design. So I'm gonna show you a video from, from that event, uh, from that project as well. Um, so let me stop sharing and let me just go to the video. Um, Chrome tab, share audio. And this must be a share audio, share. Recent reports show there are less women pursuing education in science, technology, engineering, and math fields than men. We're also underrepresented in the technology sector, but perhaps not for long. Mm -hmm. I, this news reporter Nicole Brewer has more on this really neat partnership. It's between Drexel University and Tech Girls, and it aims to change all that. Nicole, great program. Yeah, it really is. And here's the thing, Yuki and Erica. Mm -hmm. Research actually shows that girls are as interested in technology as boys are up until high school. But by the time they head off to college, they've decided to pursue pursue other fields. And once they enter the working world, will even more of them turn away from the technology. But as you two mentioned, two local groups are taking steps to reverse that trend. At Drexel University, this may look like your typical computer class, but cut a little closer and you'll see these girls are gaming, test launching, a game design curriculum for schools and students nationwide. Our hope is, is that we have more and more young girls and young women and women uh, getting interested in going into the tech industry, in my case, especially the game industry. That's why digital media professor Dr. Frank Lee teamed up with Tech Girls, a program that gives middle and high school age students hands-on experience with technology. It's gaming, programming, using robotics, and so many other pieces of technology that are happening today. It's an important part of future careers and the economy. So we need to encourage more girls to be participants. In this group, it was an easy sell. Because we can do it too, and it's just really fun. Boys shouldn't be the only one programming and making video games. I mean, it's great that they're boys, but we, we're girls and we want to do this stuff too. On this day, they tested out the program and provided feedback for Lee's team. The girls are actually helping us out. We're creating new curricula around a two-part game design program. And what we were trying to do is just see if what we've put together actually works and if there's any bugs. From there, the materials will be made available online. The girls across the country will have the opportunity to learn game design principles, how to code, and most importantly, that they can do it. Well, this partnership may be new, but Tech Girls has been providing these types of opportunities to middle and high school age students for the last five years. So, so far, 400 girls have benefited from the nonprofit organization and its programs. And I just like Very what that nice. one little one said. It's great that they're boys, but we can, we do, can it do it too. We can do it too. I was just going to say that. I love that. Fabulous. She meant it. That's fantastic. I just open that door sometimes, make it fun, and yeah. then that's all you need. Yep. Right. And Get encourage them. Exactly. You know, start early. Uh, so let me switch back to the PowerPoint file. So um, as I mentioned, by after Tetris, I felt like I, I was done with the skyscraper. I did what I wanted to do, and I began sort of focusing on one of my big passions, which is trying to get more uh, women and more underrepresented minorities into the tech, especially game industry, um, and so on. So. Um, I sort of, uh, I began working with tech girls and I began working with uh, Girl Scouts uh, for a couple of years. But uh, my interest, I came back to Skyscraper because I had this one idea. Um, and thankfully, it, this idea was funded by the Intel Corporation, where I wanted to work with middle school teachers around Philadelphia. Um, so we brought them in. And for one semester, they were learning the software tools that we created in order to create games on the Sierra Center. These were uh, basically Python uh, language, um, along with custom code that we created um, as a base, uh, as essentially an integrated developer environment. Um, 
uh, you know, for for creating games on the Sierra Center uh, on the skyscraper. Um, and the teachers learned those tools in the fall term, and then they went back in the spring term that began working with their class, uh, middle school kids, um, to help the kids design their own games. Though, so the idea that we put forth was skyscraper games made by kids, right? These are original games. Unlike recreation of classic games like Pong and Tetris, these were original games designed by kids, middle school kids from around Philadelphia. So we worked with uh, six teachers, I believe, uh, and they represented students, uh, the schools in uh, more uh, uh, economically, I guess, well-off district, more economically harder hit district, uh, school district as well, private schools, um, um, uh, and, and and so on. So we, we have kind of very diverse, wide range of schools uh, or teachers from those schools that we worked with um, and so on. So I wanted to uh, show that, uh, which became the third part, I guess, um, skyscraper games, uh, and you know, uh, Revenge of the Kids, I guess, if you want to kind of follow that line. Let me just stop sharing and show you the awesome games uh, made by kids. Uh, so again, these are all original games. So there are three part videos that I'll show. Let me see, I believe this is the first one. Share audio to make sure. my project, which was the Skyscraper Pong uh, in 2013 and Skyscraper Tetris in 2014. One of my passions still is outreach, trying to get more women and more underrepresented minorities into gaming and the game industry. The more diverse voices there are within the game industry, the more interesting diverse games we'll have. So I wanted to use this opportunity to try to get more kids programming by making games for the skyscraper. And in late 2016, um, I received funding from Intel to pursue this idea further. So we began to bring together the middle school teachers from the area and teach them through a, throughout a semester um, how to use the tools that we made to make games on the skyscraper. And in the following the spring term, they went and they worked with their students and taught their students how to use those tools, and those students made games. Wow, having your students work on a skyscraper in the city it just sounded so intriguing. I wanted to do this kind of project because uh, this is an underserved community, and I wanted to give kids an opportunity to go into technology and learn about the field and perhaps make a career out of it. So this was an opportunity to introduce coding uh, to a class, a school that never had it. One of the unique things about this project is that like they're using Python, which is a official programming language that people use like in the workplace. And a lot of coding initiatives for kids will use um, sort of coding apps that were developed specifically for education. So the, the challenges that I faced while introducing this project was definitely going from the block-based environment to a more text-based environment, you really have to change the way that the students approach a problem. Normally they were doing it physically, whereas when you code with Python, um, it's more, you know, it's, it's a little bit more abstract. Block coding in terms of an English paper would be like someone giving you a mold for the sentence, like if someone's saying, oh, for your thesis, right, I think this character blank. So in line coding, they're not giving you what's around the blank. The whole thing is a blank. So you have to come up with this with the line and the variables that go in. I've never learned coding before. This was my, it was my first time. Um, in coding, it's really easy to make an error. It's very difficult. If you have one thing typed slightly wrong, the game won't run at all. Like building a game is not really easy because you got to really use your imagination. Creativity is the hardest part. It took two or three months to figure out the game and complete it, fix all the bugs. Some of the coding was really hard, like making the borders was really hard because the code that we had didn't work, and so we had to make it on our own. There's this idea of computational thinking, which is basically a way of approaching problems um, to make them easier to solve and to generate solutions that can be implemented again and again. Oh, I think with coding, it's the ultimate opportunity to introduce 
failure to students. A lot of us say that programming really is just the act of debugging constantly. So sort of giving them the green light to not know the answers and then to understand that actually that's part of what programming is, is not knowing answers and trying to find them. And for those of us who love solving problems, it's sort of the joy of programming. The satisfaction of completing a challenge is worth going and experiencing challenges. I think if you accomplish uh, your task and complete your challenge, it's an amazing feeling. Um, we've put so much time and effort into this game, so I feel like it's going to really pay off when we see it on the skyscraper because the whole of Philadelphia will be able to see what we have done. I I'm excited to see the game. So it would actually be my first time playing the finished version of it. So I think it'll be really cool having it actually up on the skyscraper and like everyone else to see. They could also get other people into coding as well, because as you know, the huge skyscraper people would see, wow, oh my God, it's a game up there. And then come to see these middle schoolers all like coding on it and stuff like that. They might be uh, inspired to actually start coding. So the next video I want to show you is the, the kids talking about their game, describing their game. So is a game where there's two pixels. Uh, there's a red and there's a blue pixel. The blue pixel is you. You have to try not to get caught. And when you get caught, you turn green. And you gotta fill up the whole screen. But the whole purpose is for you to fill in the whole, fill in the board so it can be one solid color. It was fun coding the games. In the dot man, you want to make it through the maze without being caught. Same way Pac-Man wants to get all the dots before he's caught by a ghost. You can use the arrow keys or the uh, gamer keys, WASD, to move around. You want to navigate through the maze. You don't want to hit a wall or a dot, which is part of the maze. And if the other player, the dot, catches you, your game is over. We agreed on making a game like Centipede. You're like the shooter guy, and you have to shoot the caterpillar, and you have to try to destroy it before it gets to the bottom. And eats you up. It doesn't move like the centipede in the game centipede. It moves down the screen and then once it reaches the end, it goes back to the beginning. I call it Invasion of the Dots. So in the game, it's like a bunch of red dots and your character is a blue dot and it's trying to um, defend against the um, red dots. So the name of our game is called Falling. The character itself isn't technically falling, it's rather the obstacles that are moving up. You move the sprite around, you try not to get hit by the red ones. When you hit the red blocks, it kind of it degrades a part of your character, and when you hit the green blocks, it makes part of your character green, and every time you get all, since you have four kind of like lives on your character, every time you get all four red, part of the walls on the side come in, and then you also get more of the blocks coming up, which makes the game harder. If you want to beat the game, you're probably going to want to have a good knowledge of old classic games. What's cool about those games is that some are, of course, kind of reflective of existing games, right? It's like Space Invaders and Centipede and so on. But there are other games that are completely original, uh, which was really fascinating to me. And let me show you the final video. This is from the actual event slash festival that we put together for the kids, um, where we invited people from um, the city, from the neighborhood, to come and play the game. We had classic arcade machines there as well. We had a DJ. Um, and we also had booths from local independent game companies showcasing their games um, in this big tent. Um, and as a highlight, we actually played the kids' games. And this. Uh, next video is from that event itself. So 
in the past, uh, the games were my own projects. Um, I did Pong in 2013 and Tetris 2014. It kind of reinforces my belief in, in, in kids, in the creativity of the kids, to see original games made by the wonderful kids who collaborate with us, wonderful middle school kids and their teachers. With the help of Brandywine folks, we were able to have this festival uh, where we had classic arcade games, we had DJ, we also had games from independent game companies in Philadelphia. So it was a celebration. It became much more than what I initially uh, imagined. Well, what was really surprising to me was, you know, we kind of thought that kids could do this, middle school kids, but we had never really put that to the test. And so this was like the first time where kids were working from start to finish um, to create the games and code them themselves. I think when they were on the computer, they were just imagining this moment, right? And then this was the moment. So one of them said it was like seeing their baby brought into the world. This was a satisfying culminating activity. It really allowed the students to have that final uh, event where they could see their game being played up on the skyscraper. It was, it was one of a kind. I don't know, I think just seeing the overall final product was just so awesome because it was just so minimized on the, like, on the computer screen. But up there, it, it's real, like it's there, it's so big, it's great. So we've been waiting for a long time to see our games on the building. So it was really exciting to see my game and actually get to play it on like a huge skyscraper. It was cool to see how everyone made a different um, games, even though like it's like the same building. It took a lot of class time and a lot of lunches and with Dr. Johnson's classes. I think it's really cool and I hope I motivated other people to do the same thing and uh, get interested in coding. So, I mean, obviously the scale of the huge display is really cool, but what I really noticed while we were here tonight was the reaction of, like, this community of people coming together to support these kids who had developed these games. And you could hear, like, the reactions when somebody would do something really cool, like complete the level, or if somebody, like, almost got there and then didn't make it, like, the gasp, the collective gasp from the crowd. And I think, like, that's sort of um, part of what Frank really has envisioned is... is you know, getting more people together in a communal setting to design and develop programs um, like this. And that's it. Uh, that's the Skyscraper Games Project. That's awesome. That, all of those projects are really cool. I love to see like at the end how you actually started giving back to the community. I wasn't actually expecting that from this workshop, um, but it's definitely something that's really important in education and it's a bit project as well. So um, what plans do you have in the future for all of this? Um, so the Skyscraper trilogy, I think is, is sort of nicely packaged. This is wrapped up. Um, there are a couple of projects. Uh, that One that I just finished is called Civil Dialogue. It was funded by the Knight Foundation. And it was the idea was um, using Twitter API. We would post questions like, you know, how do we end racism in the future? Um, other sort of type of questions. What, how do we prevent future pandemic and other questions? People respond to those questions uh, on Twitter. In real time, and we would project onto a side of a building. This building is a thread in, in my <laughs> in my in my project. We project it in a seven-story building. In, in real time, the responses that were coming in through Twitter, um, and the idea is to try to bring civility uh, to to Twitter, which is a challenge. Um, so that's one project we just wrapped up. Uh, another project we're starting is with again uh, with thanks thanks to Knight Foundation. Um, is a sim city based on real city. So we're taking the data from that the city government of Philadelphia produces, such as property tax, um, incidents, crime incidents reports, and all the other data, and creating an interactive game of sim city uh, using 
uh, Buell City, I guess, uh, data from Google Maps and so on. Um, so think of it as a, a Sim City slash Philadelphia uh, with real data. So that's one project. Another one that just got approved that we ju we're just starting is uh, we're working with a couple of literary, literary magazines. Uh, so they basically publish poems and short stories uh, by authors and poets. We're working with them on a special issue uh, about for them to write about Philadelphia. And uh, we're going to take those poems and short stories and convert that into an interactive location-based AR augmented reality experience in the city of Philadelphia um, as well. So trying to figure out how can we take the classic forms of written poems and written short stories and convert that, convert them into more of a, an interactive experience and so on. So those are the, some of the projects that I'm working on. That's really amazing. I think this really helped all of the students see that like, you know, gaming is can be so much bigger than just being on a small screen. Like you could put it on yeah, a building. Absolutely. I didn't know you could do that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. You brought it up. But yeah, thank you so much for your um, help with these workshops and the career panels and everything. We were really honored to have you as a guest speaker. Um, we do have another really awesome workshop on entity uh, AI with the Microsoft game developer, Lauren, right after this. Wow. Um, I'm really excited wow, for that. Cool. Too. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Right. It's my pleasure. Take care. Take care, everyone.